And, uh, and that's why I say, you know, I don't believe the devil's disturbed that if somebody can get uh, 30 or 40,000 people to come to uh, a big stadium and fill it up on Sunday morning because he could go in and sit on the front row and never have an uncomfortable moment for the whole service. There's nothing goes on there that disturbs the devil. They, they don't preach the cross. They don't preach the blood. They restrict the Holy Spirit. They don't allow the gifts of the Spirit to operate. Why, if I were the devil, that's exactly what I would do. Get rid of the cross. Get rid of the blood. Don't let the Holy Spirit move. If I were the devil, I'd say, yeah, I'd go to church there every week. And I sadly think he does. So uh, I'm going uh, to give you, give you one of these. God bless you, you little missionary. Praise the Lord. Uh, hey, uh, oh, man, I'm excited. Let, why don't you stand with me? Let me pray. Uh, I, I met uh, your pastor in Phoenix, and they had me preach at the conference in Phoenix. And, uh, I mean, some of them like me. I think Brother, Brother Grover opened the door for me to come back. I preach a lot of play. I challenged them for missions and, and soul winning. I said, whatever happened to soul winning? Lost people are perishing. They're passing into eternity without Jesus. They're going to hell, and the church doesn't even seem to be concerned. The church in America has become so self-centered that it's all about me, 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 and entertain me, meet my needs, and don't say anything that upsets me. Don't say anything that disturbs me. Don't say anything that offends me. And a lot of pastors all over the country have sold out. They've got big crowds. So what? The devil doesn't care about their big crowds if they're not disturbed that people are perishing and going in, out into eternity every day. Oh, it breaks my heart. And I preached. I said, whatever happened to soul when I challenged people, open your eyes. There are people all around you that don't know Jesus. You don't have to go to Iraq. Or a lot of the nations where I've been, they're all around you. Your world starts with the neighbor next door. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's the great commission. It's not the great suggestion. We're all under divine orders from the captain of our salvation to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Ought to get excited that God put something in you and that you have words that you can speak the words of life. It can make the difference to somebody going to hell or going to heaven. Those words are in you. And I'm just so excited about it. Man, I tell you, we need to get stirred up. We need to be challenged once again. God, give me a burden for lost souls. God, break my heart with the things that break your heart. Break my heart with things that break I see this picture on it, and went over there and just laid my hands on it. Post I was in India not long ago. I was out in areas, the jungle areas, where little children, you, you young people and children in here, I was out where children have never heard, Jesus loves me, this I know. I know I sing terribly, but never heard that song. For the Bible tells me so. Never heard it. Never heard one person say, Jesus loves you. Never heard it. Darkness like you can't imagine. So full of fear. So full of fear. Things I can't even talk about happening to, to young girls out in those villages. It breaks your heart. And we, in America, we're, we're so fix, fixated on ourselves. That meet my needs. You just want to come drag around like we don't have anything to do. Oh, my God. We're ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here as representatives of heaven. What else do you have that's more important to do than to walk around being an ambassador of heaven on earth telling people that Jesus loves them? You don't have anything more important to do. So, oh, God, help us. I pray, pray for Priscilla. Pray for missionaries. Some of you young people in here, God may touch some of you. You may end up being a missionary evangelist, you may decide that there's nothing more important in life than giving yourself to Jesus, giving him your whole heart, not holding anything back, and throwing yourself out there in reckless abandon to serve this great God. Hallelujah. I was a wasted, just keep standing with me because you're going to sit a while. He said, take all the time I need. So stand, don't, don't be upset. You're standing, you're going to be sitting a while. No, I was a wasted drug addict, drug dealer, Facing a lot of time in prison, I'm here not because I hired the best criminal lawyer in St. Louis, but because God had mercy on me. But uh, God raised me up. God delivered me, and he set me free, healed me of hepatitis. After the doctors had given up on me, 
I, no wonder I want to tell people about Jesus. I believe the gospel still has power. I believe the blood of Jesus that redeemed me, saved me, delivered me. It hadn't lost its power, so i got to tell people wherever I go what happened to me. He set me free. We need to shake ourselves and wake up and not drag around like, like we forgot what happened to us. Man, you were going to hell. You were on your way to hell. You were destined to hell. The devil was your master. He owns you. You sold yourself to him through sin. And one day you met Jesus and he set you free. Oh, my. Oh, we got to talk about it. We got to tell people. You can't shut me up. You can't shut me up. They try to shut me up everywhere. I'm not going to shut up. I go to nations where, oh, I, I don't I'm going to talk about it. You can't shut me up. I can't help myself. Can't help myself. People tell me I'm crazy all the time. Why? Tell me something I didn't already know for crying out loud. I lost my mind before I ever got saved. Any brain power I have left is what Jesus gave back to me. I'm going to live with the mind of Christ. I don't care if people think I'm crazy. Sometimes you got to be crazy to get people's attention in this world we live in. Oh, help me, Jesus. I tell you what, this, I don't know where this is going to go today. I better pray. I better pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this pastor. Thank you for Sister Linda, for their love, for their devotion, for their sacrifice. Thank you that you put a vision in their hearts, Lord, and and they've been obedient to the heavenly vision, and this church is here for his glory. Christian Assembly is here to represent heaven on earth and to let the light of Jesus shine. God, and it's become not just a lighthouse to the community, but to the nations. Now, I thank you for a mission-minded church where people still come before service to pray. Oh, God, have your way here. I want to yield to you. I lift up to the, the name of Jesus to declare that Jesus is a name above every name. I say to all the powers of darkness that have opposed this pastor, that have opposed this church, that are contrary to the Holy Spirit, that are opposed to the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're all defeated in Jesus' name, and your power is broken. And I declare that I have an intimate relationship with the king who's ruling everything. And I just proclaim the victory, the blood-bought victory of Calvary. Before I even open the Bible and preach today, I proclaim victory in Jesus' name. Now I say that this place is holy ground. The Spirit of God is in control. Jesus is Lord here. The powers of darkness are bound. And the Spirit of the living God can do whatever he wants to do. In Jesus' name, God, help me to preach what you've put on my heart. Touch the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach from 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to try to get there, and I'm going to try to run, not to uh, keep you all day. 2 Timothy 4, uh, and, and I'm going to call this Paul's perspective, and I'll deal mainly uh, with verses 6 through 8. But just by way of introduction, Paul in 2 Timothy 4, he's warning people about the very times we're living in, and he said there's a time that, that's coming. People won't endure sound doctrine. They'll heap to themselves teachers after their own lust, having itching ears. That's what's happening in the church today, and that's why we, we have mega churches where the true gospel, the authentic gospel of the New Testament isn't even preached. People go there, and they hear what they want to hear. Paul said it would be that way in the last days, but Paul told Timothy, as he wrote to Timothy, he was writing from prison, and as he's writing from prison, he tells Timothy, he says, in the midst of all this, preach the word. Preach the word. You know, there are a lot of word, so-called word preachers. They never preach the word. If they do, they preach just a little slice of it, all positive. They run from most of it. They don't preach the word. You ought to thank God you got a pastor who preaches the word. I've heard about him. Others have told me about him. I know he preaches the word. You're blessed to be in a church where you have a real word preacher. Preach the word. Man, this, this is powerful. God put himself in this book. You pray over it, and, and you read it in faith, and the Spirit of God anoints you as you read. This word becomes life. It becomes power. And in the precious promises, the exceeding great and precious promises of God, God put him, his very 
own being in his word. It says that by these, by these exceeding great and precious promises, you become partakers of the divine nature. This book's not like any other book. That's why I get so upset at what preachers are doing to it, misrepresenting the gospel, perverting it, twisting it, making it say what they wanted to say. We need to handle the word of God with integrity, as I believe your pastor does, and we need to preach the word. Preach the word. Not just like I am up here. I mean, preachers, that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to preach. But I mean, every believer, preach the word. Don't, don't leave. I, I, don't, don't leave. I get people leave. No. <laughs> no. She left her purse. She's coming back. Preach the word. Preach the word. Not just with words, but by your life. You're the only Bible some people will ever read. And live your life for Jesus. Let your light shine in this world. Don't, don't. Yield to the fear that's out there. Don't yield to the, the powers of darkness that are trying to intimidate you. Stand up like you know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Stand up in the midst of all the darkness like God sent you here and like you're here on a mission, like you're just passing through. Live in this world like you don't belong to it, but live like you're not afraid of it and speak into the darkness and release the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ by preaching the word. Preach the word. All right, that's what I'm going to try to do today. Beginning in verse, verse 6. Remember now, Paul's in prison. He knows he's going to die shortly. He's, he's uh, going, to, going to be leaving this earth. And sometimes, you, I mean, a lot of times people, when they know they're, they're getting ready to leave, they talk about what's most on their hearts, what's most important to them for their, their final words. Here's Paul writing from prison to his disciple, Timothy. He says, for I'm ready I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. He's coming back. May not be very long. May be just a little further. He's coming back. I'm telling you, I want to get ready to meet Jesus. Paul's perspective, how he looked at life, how he saw life. He said, I'm now ready to be offered. He saw life as an altar. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. He saw life as a journey. He didn't try to build his kingdom in this world. He didn't even belong to this world. He said in verse 7, I fought a good fight. He saw life as a battle. He said, I've finished my course. He saw life as a race. He said, I've kept the faith. He saw life as a sacred trust. Oh, I want to have Paul's perspective on life. He said, for I am now ready to be offered. Think about it. He's in prison. He's not crying. He's not saying, somebody bail me out. Somebody get me a lawyer. Oh, this isn't right. I paid tithes my whole life. I was faithful, went to church, and now look at me. I'm in prison, and everybody's forgotten me. Wah, wah, wah. Paul wasn't even craving in prison. He wasn't even crying. Got too many wah, wah, wahers in the pulpit today, pulpits of America today. Just say boo, and they'll back up. Puny little demon comes up and goes, boo, and they go, ah, you call 911. I said, oh, Jesus, help us. How many know the church needs a revival? We've got to remember who Jesus is and remember who we are and stand up and challenge everything that's not like Jesus. Now, I don't want you to have to fight everything like I do. Not everybody's called to do that. But I want to have the attitude the apostle Paul had. He's getting ready to die. They're probably going to cut his head off. The Roman guillotine, what's he saying about it? He's saying, I'm now ready to be offered. He doesn't even have the attitude that the devil's going to kill him. He doesn't have the attitude that, that they're, they're going to take his life from him. He says, nobody's taking I'm already a dead man. How do you kill a dead man? I died a long time ago. People say, what's wrong with you, man? You act like you're, you're trying to get killed. I say, you can't kill me. I died a long time ago. I'm going to leave here when God's ready to take me home. Now, I'm not leaving any sooner. But it's, I mean, when he doesn't have another thing for me to do, let me get out of here. I'm tired of walking around this miserable thing that, that I have to drag around. I'm tired of living in this body that aches and doesn't want to get out of bed and doesn't want to pray and doesn't want to do anything God wants to do. I'm tired of walking around in this miserable 
<laughs> Suit the clothes I have to live in. This isn't me. I'm somebody different. There's a new creation inside of me, and I tell the devils that come against me all the time, kill me, and you still lose. I just, I mean, for crying out loud, I'm not going to die. I'm just going to get out of this body and go to a better place. What a deal. <laughs> what a deal. Oh, we ought to get excited. We ought to remember who we are. I mean, death's not on high on the list. In fact, it's not even on the list of things I fear. Why should I fear death? Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. He's not laying in jail said, Shh, saying they're going to kill me. He's saying, come on, death. I mean, he's ready to welcome death. He'll say, I'll shake hands. You're my friend. You're my ticket out of here. I mean, if you, got the, if you really have the revelation and you're a believer, you know that death isn't something you need to fear. Death is a just your ticket out of here. It's a passageway to a better place. I'm going to go to heaven when... This body lays down, gets laid down. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to wake up in heaven. Hallelujah. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. He lived as if life to him, the gift of life to Paul. What did he do with it? He said, I see life as an altar. He placed himself on the altar every day. Romans chapter 12, he, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. He said, present yourselves to God as a living every day, every day. It's a privilege, isn't it? It's a privilege to be able to present yourself to God and get up on the altar and say, here I am, do what you want to do with me. Make me thy fuel, thy flame of God. Consume me, use me. I'm not my own. I give myself to you. Jesus captured my heart. He captured my heart. He, he, Jesus loved me, and with love, he captured my heart. I belong to him. So I gladly place myself on the altar. What some people call sacrifice, I call privilege. What some people call duty, I call honor. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to live for Jesus. You don't have to make me. I mean, you young people, you're probably here because you were, had to come to church. Your mom and your dad made you come to church. I pray you'll just have an experience like I did where nobody has to make you come to church. You come because you want to because you know this world doesn't have anything for you. This world's full of lies and deception, and it, it'll do everything it can to deceive you. It'll pull on you and try to get you off the path. The, if you want to find real joy and real fulfillment and real meaning and purpose in life, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus is what can give you lasting fulfillment, purpose, and meaning in life. I want to challenge you. Make up your mind while you're young to give your life to Jesus and not hold anything back. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. You know, I like that attitude. I mean, think about it. We're, we're, I mean, we're, we're fearful of persecution. She just came from Iraq, horrible persecution there. I've been in places like, like China, Russia. Some of the stories that the persecuted believers there told me, oh, it moved my heart. And I think, don't, I don't ever want to say ouch again. I don't want to complain about anything again. When I hear the stories and I come back to America, I hear people whining and crying and complaining about every little inconvenience. I say, oh, God, help me. I'm going to get up and preach and Kill everybody, make everybody mad before I even get started because I think, oh, it shouldn't be like this. shouldn't be like this. Look at, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Have mercy on me. People are suffering all over the world. People are suffering all over the world, but th with joy in their hearts. Man, I was with a man in Russia, and he kept jumping around after I preached. I, I preached it in Moscow uh, just when the Iron Curtain was coming down. The Russian believers were so excited. They were so hungry. And this man was like 86 years old. And he was just jumping around and dancing excited. He kept wanting to talk to me. And his wife was one of these Russian babushkas. And she kept pushing him away and saying no. And the, the interpreter, is, I said, what does that man want? And he said, he wants to give you his testimony. His wife keeps telling him to be quiet, that you don't want to hear his testimony. I said, but I do want to hear his testimony. He told me they, they arrested him for preaching and uh, telling everybody about Jesus put him in prison. They beat him uh, horribly, but he got a New Testament in there. And he said at night, there was one stream of light that came through the window in his cell and he would get over by the commode and he would read that New Testament. That doesn't sound like a very comfortable way to live, does it? Leaning on the commode just to catch one ray of light come in the cell, reading the New Testament that they smuggled into him. 
I said, man, he said, do you know what? He had a big smile. He's 86 years old. He survived beatings and persecution. He said, he said, you know what? The word of God became to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. He was in prison. There's somebody who had been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he lived. He saw life the way Paul did, like an altar. He was glad to present himself, surrender himself fully to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, but then they caught me one night reading the New Testament. I said, what happened then? He said, they beat me until they thought I was dead. And they took me outside. It was the middle of winter. And he said, they put me on a pile of bodies. I mean, you can't imagine the, the, the horrible thing. Sometimes you see the news, but you don't see what's really happening behind the scenes. He said, they put me on top of a pile of bodies. And he said, I laid there. He said, I don't know how long. I was out there, but it was cold. I know it was cold. I was giving out gospel tracts in Red Square in, in, in Moscow, and I closed my eyes for too long and couldn't open them back up. My eyelids froze. I had to hold my hands on my on my eyes to get them to thaw out. So I don't my eyes. I mean, it's cold over there. And uh, he said, I, I was laying there, and he said, I, I was almost dead, but he said I could feel them. I was just getting colder and colder. He said, but that morning, the uh, guards that came for the morning shift one of them, as he went by, my toe moved, and he came in, and he told some of the young uh, soldiers in the prison, go out and get that guy on top of the pile. He's still alive. And he said, they dumped me into my cell, and he said, I, he said, I felt my blood just start. It's like it thawed out and just started kind of moving slowly through my veins. And then he said, and then I was back. And uh, I said, what'd you do then? He said, they smuggled another New Testament. And I, I read the New Testament, and his word became to me the joy and the rejoicing in my heart. And he said, finally, they, they let me out after years, and they said, you can't ever preach again. He said, Jesus loves you. I said, well, no, you didn't. He said, I preached all the way out of the prison, and I've been preaching ever since. Hallelujah. I said, man. You know, if I was the devil, I'd get a little nervous about then. I thought, what are you going to do if you got people like that running around? What are you going to do? I mean, just when the devil thinks he, he's got control of everything, some little Russian man that's been beat to death and put on a pile of bodies till he nearly froze, jumps up and starts saying, Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus loves you. Oh, I want to live that way. I want to be willing to give my life, place myself on the altar, and I challenge you to do it too. Man, I don't know how much time we have left, but let's take the time we have left and let's give it to God. Let's live for God like we really believe this gospel. Let's stop being so concerned about our lives in this world. I know preachers that are retiring. A young guy, a young guy retired, a guy that I brought into ministry. I raised him up, or ordained him. He retired. He's only 70 years old for crying out loud. A young guy like that retiring? What in the world's wrong with him? What do you want to retire for? I'm not going to retire. I'm going to refire. And if I can't refire, I'm going to retread. But I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to preach. I'm going to be in the devil's face till Jesus comes, till the eastern sky splits open, and the glory of God fills that I'm going to be preaching because it doesn't matter to me whether I live in this world or whether what my life's like here. I'm not trying to make a comfortable life for myself in this world. I want to live like somebody who's placed his life on the altar I don't care. I'm ready to be offered. Devil's not going to kill me. There's something in me that's indestructible. He might, he might put a bullet in my head. I don't know. Might get my head cut off someday. But that's not going to do me in. I'm telling the devils, kill me and I still win. And you ought to think about it before you kill me because when I get out of this body... God might have something else for me to do, and I might not have all these restraints on my do now. I might be more troubled to him on the other side than I am here. I want to live with that mentality. Paul said, I'm ready to be offered. Is it all right to preach like this? I got people leaving. What did I do? I did I uh, maybe they had day to go to work or something, I hope. I don't know. It happens to me around and now and then, and, and I haven't even said anything yet. I'm ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Man, I love this. Here he is. He's not, he's, he knows he's going to die. They're going to take his head off. And he says, the time of my departure is at hand. Why? If you, if you got that man to see a, a psychiatrist to, uh, to talk to, he would have him paint him so crazy. If I had time, I'd tell you, sorry, when I, I had hepatitis, I had to go to the hospital. And I got there, 
And they said, Mr. Sutton, uh, because of your drug history, we'll, we'll have to have you go to the mental, they still call them the mental wards back then. They said, we'll have, you, have to have you go to the mental ward before we can admit you to the medical floor. It's just hospital policy. I said, I don't care. I signed myself in the middle ward. When the middle ward was preaching to people, having a good time over there. But uh, I don't have time to tell you that story, but it's a wild one. But uh, people think you're crazy. You talk like this. They're going to kill you, Paul. I know the time of my departure is at hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> he, he's looking at him with a smile on his face. Hey, did you hear us? We're going to kill you. I know. Hallelujah. I'm going to get on the glory train. Woo! Getting out of here. We're going to kill you, man. I know. Just like he's saying, the time of my departure is at hand. Now, tomorrow, I'm excited. I'm flying back during the eclipse. I'm saying, woo, what's that going to be like? I'm going to go through. Ah, but that's how Paul saw life. It's a journey. It's a journey. I'm just passing through. Some of you need to remember that it's your pilgrims on this earth. You're just passing through. You're just here for a little while. Stop trying to live like this world's your home. Stop trying to build a kingdom on this earth. Get over all the concern you have about your life on this earth and don't do what my preacher friend did and retire when you're a young man of 70 years old. We've got work to do. Just, man... I tell people, I'm going to live until I die. And then I'm going to live a little longer. Time of my departure is at hand. I'm going to get on an airplane. I'm going to get out of here. I mean, think about it. You young people, any of you, ever, did you still watch Superman? I never know anybody. anybody. You guys still like Superman, you young guys? Anybody ever watch any of Superman? Come on, talk. I'm in the little audience participation. You like Superman? Hey, here's a young woman that in the back likes Superman. I like Superman. I like, you know, he's, he's more powerful than a, 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 a locomotive, a, faster than a speeding bullet. He can leap tall buildings at a single bound. I tell people, Superman doesn't have anything on me. I, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get on that plane. I'm going to fly out of this world and end up in heaven. I'm going to get into a glorified body. I'll be one up on Superman every one of those things, I'm going to go to heaven and get in a glorified body. I'm not going to float around on a cloud and play a harp. I don't know what God might have for me to do. I mean, it's limitless. I don't want to live like I'm so concerned about my life in this world, just want to be comfortable in this world, worry about, I know more preachers that are worrying about what am I going to do for retirement. I forget about retirement for crying out loud. Stop worrying about it and just serve Jesus. Oh, God, help me. Kind of messed up. Time of my departures. Think about it. You're on a journey. Life is a journey. It's a journey. You're passing through. You don't belong to this world. Don't act like you do. Don't let anybody make you think you do. You young people, you pretty young girls, some guy comes along. You know, I used to be a youth minister in another lifetime. I'd tell, I'd tell pretty young girls, I'd say, listen, I know there's three words you just like to hear. I love you. I said, next time some young guy tells you I love you, say, shut up. You don't even know what love is. Jesus loves me. You just give yourself to Jesus and wait for his best, and don't let something pull you out in this world. And young guys, same way. I met the devil a lot of times wearing a pretty face. Wasn't a bad body he walked up in either. You should see some of the places I've been around this world. And uh, beautiful women ch chasing me. Can you imagine that? They were hitting on me everywhere. I said, man, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I said, oh, no, I know what's behind that. I know what's behind that pretty face. I know what's behind that. Listen, you don't belong to this world. Don't let the world take hold of you and pull you back. You stay close to Jesus. You're just passing through. You've got a better place to go. Hallelujah. Help me, Jesus. Paul said, I fought a good fight. We need to fight. We need to fight. I don't know what's happened to preachers in America, but a lot of them don't have any fight in them. Some of them don't even have any backbone. I tell preachers all the time, they get mad at me. Leave my meetings and everything else. I say, grow a backbone. 
Learn to stand for something. Learn to stand against something and not cave in and compromise every time some puny little demon says boo. God help us. We need soldiers in the church. You know what General William Booth used to say? He said, my best men are women. What was he saying? He raised up an army of soldiers, and the majority of his army, well, I mean, the biggest percentage were women. Raise up soldiers. We need soldiers, spiritual soldiers, who are going to march in the army of God and who realize life is not a playground, it's a battleground. This world's not a playground, it's a battleground. I'm here to fight the powers of darkness for the souls of men and women and boys and girls. I'm here to wrestle with the powers and principalities of darkness and make them turn loose of lost souls. Oh, my God, if you've got the life of Jesus in you, you've got the power of God in you, then wake up and realize it matters that you pray. It matters that you witness because you, I mean, witnessing is hand-to-hand spiritual combat. It's not just that person you're talking to. The powers of darkness are taking hold of that person. They want to drag them down into hell. You might be the very thing that makes it difference you got to fight realize what it's all about realize what it's all about i'm fighting the powers of darkness so lost souls can be saved paul said i fought a good fight man can you imagine when the devils wherever paul was at when he woke up in the morning they're saying oh come oh man just sleep a little longer they hated it when that man woke up they probably hated when he was sleeping because his spirit was still active but he had authority, and he attacked. <clears throat> Wasn't playing this silly little game, secret sensitive philosophy that's come into the church today. Don't offend anything. Be careful what you say. Don't, don't make anybody mad. I've made all kinds of people mad. I had a man that gave me uh, several thousand dollars a week and sometimes bigger offerings for projects. He came up to me, didn't like what I was preaching, and he gave me the opportunity to tweak what I was preaching a little bit And uh, he said, if I didn't, he was going to leave and his money was going to go with him. I said, God bless you. I'm not for sale. I'm not for sale. I mean, I'm fighting. I'm in something that that counts for a lot more than than this. So these people water it down. They don't want to offend anything. They're afraid to say anything that might. So in the process, nobody gets convicted of sin. Nobody lives with a burden for lost souls. Nobody has a real sense of what it means to pass into eternity without Jesus. Nobody's preaching about hell anymore. And so people are in a fog. They're in a, under spiritual delusion. They don't even realize what's at stake. We need some soldiers who will begin to rise up and fight and challenge the powers of darkness and disturb the atmosphere. I want to disturb the atmosphere. I believe that's what revival's born, when the atmosphere is disturbed. And you see, the Bible, I'm telling you, the great men and women of God in the Bible and throughout history have understood we're fighting the powers of darkness for lost souls. They're not going to roll over and play dead. The devil's not going to roll over and play dead. You've got to make him turn loose. You've got to fight. You got to fight. So you might as well get get used to the idea. Forget about this idea. I'm going to live my best life now. That's the stupidest thing that a preacher could ever say. I don't care how popular he is, how big he is, or how nice of a smile he has. I don't care about his hairdo. I don't care about any of it. You say, you're going to live your best life now? I'm not even trying to live. I'm trying to die for crying out loud. I don't want to live my best life now. I want to die. You're crazy, man. No, I'm not. Paul knew what he was talking about. Galatians 2.20, for I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. That's Paul's idea of living your best life now. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's my take on live your best life now. Just die. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. I don't like what the devil's doing. I don't like what's happening. 
to pe people all over the world who are perishing and going into eternity without Jesus. Outside of Jesus Christ, God becomes a consuming fire. Oh, you ought to be fighting for your loved ones. You ought to be fighting for your children. You ought to be praying for lost souls that are all around you because when they go out into eternity, if they don't meet Jesus in this on this side, they're not going to meet a loving father like you are. They're going to discover that God's wrath against sin burns with white hot fury, and they're going to meet a God, a holy God, who's burning with wrath against sin. You don't think that's real? That's what the Bible says, but you don't get many preachers to preach this sort of thing. I'm telling you, we got to fight because the devil's not playing games. He's doing everything he can to destroy people, and you have something in you. You can do something about it. If you'll pray, if you'll really pray, if you'll go after the powers of darkness and challenge them and defy them and wage warfare against them until you make them, make them, turn loose, let go. Man, I've had to fight. I've had to wrestle devils for lost souls. I'm going to fight for my children. I'm going to fight for my loved ones. I'm going to fight for lost souls. Don't want anybody to die and go to hell. I'm going to fight. Paul saw life as a battle. This isn't a playground. These little secret sensitive churches and, and a lot of the superstars of religion on television making it sound like your kingdom's in this world. Well, their kingdom is half the time. They sold out a long time ago. And when they say, God, what I hear is mammon. I say, hey, I know what's going on here. I'm not going to be deceived by that. I'm not going to bow down and worship the altars of bigness because I've been in a lot of big churches and I knew God wasn't there. Devils were there. You know, if the devil came in here, he wouldn't be too comfortable. The devil came in here and sat down in the front row. You, I mean, you, Really, did I give you a commercial? You really should buy my book, Devil on the Front Row. You'll, under, you'll, you'll understand me a little better. But, I mean, I don't think if, if a devil came in here this morning and sat down, he wouldn't have been comfortable even before the service started. People are praying. He didn't like people to pray. And then when worship started, I'm telling you what, you would have seen that devil. He had been jerking and twitching and, and gyrating. He would have been a miserable, miserable little thing. And then I hope I preach something that might make him a little bit uncomfortable. But I'm not going to try to just do what I can to not offend anybody or not upset anything. I'm at war. I'm a soldier in the army of God. I challenge some of you to remember that you're a soldier and that this is an army. And the church is an army with banners, and we've got to march across this world proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, establishing the kingdom of God, and asserting the authority of Jesus. I tell devils everywhere I go, Jesus is Lord here. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how it seems. I don't care how much noise you make. Jesus is Lord. I mean, it's a de declaration of war. It's a declaration of war. Some of you are sitting around thinking, man, this scares me. All this talk about fighting. Well, get over it. You know how you get over your fears? You face them. You face them. I've, I, you know what? I've, I've looked death in the face many times. I was in Nicaragua, and a Sandinista soldier had an a automatic rifle in my head, and he's bumping me in the forehead. I mean, it's bad enough he's, he's got it my head, and every now and then he bumped me with it. That hurt. And he, he so, so what do you do when a crazy communist soldier's got an automatic rifle at your head saying, Sandino was killing the gringos, and we are killing them too. What do you do? I said, Dios mio. No, I said, I just, I just started praying in other tongues. I mean, what do you do at a time like that? Oh, you can have your little seeker-sensitive gospel if you want to. I'm glad I have the Holy Ghost, and I pray in other tongues because I'm alive to tell you the story. And that's just one of many stories. What do you do when witch doctors come out to shut you down and, and bring people, send people to kill you right in the middle of your crusade? What do you do? I don't know what you do, but I pray in other tongues. <laughs> and I'm still here to tell you the story. Man, this is war. We're in a fight. I want to fight the good fight of faith. Remember that Jesus is Lord of everything. I don't care how it looks. The devil's never going to run anything. The devil's never going to rule anything. Even when it looks like he is, 
Jesus is Lord. Jesus is a name above every name. It's a declaration of war. Every time you speak it, if you really believe it, it's a declaration of war. I'm telling you, the church is an army with banners. We're here. We're in hostile territory. We are, we've occupied enemy territory. The devil's still the prince of the power of the air, and any Christian, any real Christian will stand up and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. It's a challenge to the powers of darkness who want to think they're running everything, and every time you stand up, proclaim the lordship and the authority of Jesus Christ. You're challenging everything they assert. Oh, Paul saw life as a battle. Man, I got to hurry here. You know, some of you think I'm talk. I talk fast. I'm talking fast. I tell you, 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 you I, I need to shift into higher gear. Help me, Jesus. He saw life. Think about it. You remember Acts chapter 19 when Paul went to town. The uh, uh, the, the uh, seven sons of Sceva. Uh, they were sons of like the high priests. They were religious boys, strong religious boys. And uh, they watched Paul, and Paul was casting devils out of people. Way to go see if we can make some devils mad enough to manifest so we can cast them out. I try to make devils mad wherever I go because they try to hide from you in the United States. They don't hide in other, a lot of other places. They try to hide from you. Sometimes you got to make them mad enough. They come at you, then you get to cast them out. Hallelujah. You find out. You think you? I mean, you'd be scared. I mean, I've been with. I've taken preachers with me in other countries, big faith talkers, and they're ready to wet their pants. First little demon possessed person that comes along. I said, "Man, you're going to have to get a. This going to have to be an intense course, and it's going to have to be quick." And uh, but uh, you know what, Paul? Man, he didn't mess around. These guys watched Paul, and they said, "Look, Paul cast de demons out of people. Look what he's doing." And then they said, we can do that. It's just religious people that way, they're just dumb. I mean, if you're religious, if you're religious, you're just dumb. You're dumb as a box of rocks. That's what religion, religious people are. I'm not religious. I have a relationship with Jesus. Religious people are as dumb as a box of rocks. And they, these religious boys, they looked at Paul. Stay away. I mean, don't let yourself get under legalistic religious people that want to put you in bondage. Man. But anyway, they looked at Paul. And they said, look at that. He just says, in the name of Jesus, come out. And they demons go. So they said, we can do that. They got a scrawny little demon-possessed boy. And they all seven of them ganged up on him. And they said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, we adjure you, come out of him. The Bible says in Acts 19, that little uh, demon-possessed boy jumped on them, beat them up, stripped them of their clothes, chased them down Main Street naked, screaming, Jesus, we know, and Paul, we know, but who are you? Man, if you hear a devil, if a devil says, who are you? You better run. You better run. Listen, I'm telling you, Paul disturbed the atmosphere where he was at because he lifted up Jesus. Lifted up Jesus, and he wasn't here on a picnic. He wasn't here just trying to build his kingdom on this earth. He wasn't here to live his best life now. He was here declaring war on the powers of darkness because he didn't like what they were doing to people he loved, and he fought them every day of his life. Oh, I want to have that mentality. I want to have that mentality. Paul said, I fought a good fight. How many want to do that? Wave at me if you're still here. You're still awake. Some of you are looking at me like, oh, I hope he shuts up. He looks like he could preach all day. I could. You want me to? Hey, some, some people want me to. Listen, Paul, Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. You know what? Christianity is not a 50-yard dash. It's a marathon. Paul said, I finished my course. L to Paul, life was a race. He was running this race. He wasn't running, competing with other Christians. He was just running to stay in the race. That's all you got to do. Just keep running. Sometimes you're not going to feel much like running. I used to feel, do you, can you believe I used to run five miles every day? Do you believe that? Some of you young people, you believe I used to run five miles? It's hard to believe, isn't it? I used to run five miles every day. One time, one time I decided I was going to get in a marathon. I had to uh, run like 15 miles, I think it was. And, and so I started training for it. And one day I decided I'd been running six miles and then seven miles. One day I decided I'm just going to run 11 miles today. I had a course mapped out. And I got it. I got the seventh mile, and then I got just a little past the seventh mile, and my body was screaming, man. It was screaming at me. He said, well, my, does your body ever talk to you? My body talks to me. It was saying, stop it, please. Have more. You're killing me. You're killing me. And I said, shut up. I don't consult my flesh. People say, how do you feel? If I'm feeling real bad, I say, I never consult my flesh. Doesn't matter how this thing feels. I got to drag it around, make it do what it doesn't want to do anyway. 
How do you feel today? Well, I don't feel like praying. Shut up. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter if you feel like praying tonight. You're going to pray anyway. I've got to drag this thing around and make it do what it doesn't want to do all the time. But I'm running my body screaming, saying, you're killing me. You're killing me. But you know what? I kept running. Kept running. I thought I was going to. I'm a, <laughs> I thought my heart's going. <laughs> I thought, this is crazy. You're going to kill yourself. Ah, I just I kept running. It's an amazing thing. I, I, you know, I always heard about it, but I guess I broke through this barrier and got into what you call the runner's high, and all of a sudden I'm like, <sighs> and I felt, I felt like I was high. I thought, man, man, how about that? What if you just keep running when you can't run anymore? Some of you have had all kinds of pressure. You've had all kinds of problems. You've had all kinds of pain. Life has been hard. And life has just jumped up, and reality slapped you hard. And sometimes you get discouraged. Sometimes you feel like you just want to sit down. I'm going to challenge you. Make up your mind that you're going to keep running when you don't think you can run anymore. Make up your mind, I'm going to get up when my body tells me I can't get up. I'm going to keep running when I can't run him, when I run out of strength, I'm still going to keep going because when I get past my strength, he'll give me his strength. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to tell you, Paul said, I finished my course. He said, I didn't stop short of the goal. Philippians 3, 14, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, you're not going to stop me. You're not going to stop me. I don't care what you throw at me. I don't care what you bring against me. I don't care how intense the pressure becomes. I'm going to keep running this race. You're not going to put me on the sidelines. Don't let some devil sideline you. Get up and get back in the race. Make up your mind. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I'm going to keep running. One of these days, I won't be running on carpet or concrete or grass or dirt. I'll look down. There'll be gold under my feet. I'm going to run out of this world. I'm going to keep running till I run over into another world. Paul saw life as a race, saw life as an altar, saw life as a, a journey, saw life as a fight. He saw life as a race. And then finally, he saw life as a sacred trust. You know, as you live this life, something's been entrusted to you. You've been entrusted with the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the most powerful message that's ever hit this planet. And you have the honor of marching as a soldier in the army of God, marching and following the greatest commander the world has ever seen. You have the distinct honor of forsaking everything just for the privilege of following Jesus. And you've been entrusted with the gospel. girl there in India. I mean, I, I'm president of ministry to India. But, uh, it haunts me. It haunts me. Think about all the people in darkness. This is a sacred trust. If I never get to go back to India, I guarantee you, if I never get to get on an airplane and fly over there, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in India. I'm going to go to India in the spirit. I'm going to pray I'm going to mess with devils. I'm going to attack devils in India, and I may be on my knees right here at For His Glory Christian Assembly, and you'll hear me praying, and you'll think I'm right here with you, and I'm over there in India telling devils to let go. I'm telling you what. I want the gospel to be preached to people in darkness. 100,000 souls a day, more now. It's 100,000 when I memorize this poem. 100,000 souls a day are passing one by one away in Christless guilt and gloom without one ray of hope or light. With future dark as endless night, they're passing to their doom. And I have been entrusted with a gospel. I've been entrusted with the words of life and I can pray, and I can speak, and I can say something that makes a difference for somebody spending an eternity in hell or in heaven. It's a sacred trust. What a responsibility. Oh, God, I want to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, when I leave this world, I've kept the faith. What was he saying? I've remained a Christian. 
I've been faithful to the heavenly calling. I've not been disobedient to the heavenly calling. I've been true to the truth. I have preached the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. I want to leave this world that way. I want you to stand with me. I'm not going to preach to you all day. I did. Uh, you guys, I like ch churches where they pray, and then they don't rush worship, and then they have a uh, special song. They have a missionary get up, tell you, oh, you ought to be excited. That you're connected to a pastor and a church that loves the nations and loves the lost, and you'd have a, a young woman like this who's willing to uh, go do what most women her age aren't doing. They're looking for other things, thinking about other things. And she came from Iraq and gave you a report. Man, you ought to be thankful that you're a part of this church and not part of some seeker-sensitive church, maybe big congregation, but where the devil can go sit on the front row and never be uncomfortable in the whole service. You ought to be glad you're here, and you ought to tell other people. You ought to get other people to come in here. Start inviting everybody that uh, you can think of. Call them up. Go see them. Say, you got to get over here. But more important, I mean realize this is a sacred trust. You've been entrusted with the words of life. Now, you may not like President Trump, but if he walked in here right now and he came up and he said, Ron, man, we've been looking for you everywhere. I'd say, President Trump. Welcome to For His Glory Christian Assembly. Glad you came today. Sit down. I'm not finished preaching yet. Ah. But what if he said, Ron, we need somebody to be an ambassador to the United States. To, I was headquartered in Zambia, Africa for a while. I said, what if he said, we need you, you to be the ambassador of the United States to Zambia. Hmm. Pretty important job. I'm honored, Mr. President, honored that you would consider me, but I'm going to have to say no. You think you are crazy. I'm not crazy. You see, the president of the universe has already enlisted me to be an ambassador. I've got something to do. I've got a job that's worth doing. And he's entrusted something to me. He's entrusted the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to me. Isn't it amazing that you can speak the words? You can say to somebody, you can go up and quote John 3.16, somebody you've been praying for and you're talking to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can share the gospel with somebody, pray with them, and in a moment's time they get picked up and taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought over here into the kingdom of God's dear son from light to darkness just like that because you preached the gospel, shared the words of life. It's a sacred trust. Let's be faithful to this gospel. Let's be faithful to this gospel. Let's remember that we're here to be ambassadors. Amen? Well, it's probably later than it normally is. You did a lot. I preached to you for a little while, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this. I don't know if but have a little music. You don't have anything better to do. You don't have anything better to do. I mean, I could eat lunch. I don't know where I'm going to put it the way they've fed me since I've been here, but I could eat lunch. But you know what? Lunch is as important as me giving God a moment to speak to me if he wants to. You don't have anything better to do. You don't have anything more important to do than take a moment to respond to God. I pray you'll leave here saying, hey, life to me, it's an altar. I'm going to put myself on it. Life to me, it's a journey. Now I'm going to be ready uh, to get on that plane when it comes. Life to me, it's a battle. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. Life to me, it's a race. I'm going to keep running. I don't care how hard it gets. I don't care how much pressure there is. I'm going to keep running. And you know how I'm going to run? I'm going to lift up my eyes and look unto Jesus. And he's going to help me continue. And I'm going to live my life like I've got something that's been given to me by God. And it's a sacred trust. I'm going to be faithful. Is there anybody in you, you say, you'll come today and just maybe kneel down and pray or maybe stand here and just say, God, I want to live with a sense 
that I've been entrusted with something that's so precious. It's a sacred trust. I want to give myself to you more fully than I ever have. I want you to come. Just take a few moments. Forget about what time it is. Man, just tell your flesh to shut up. Say, I want, I want to do business with God. Reach out to God. Just come and say, I'm going to bow down. I'm going to give myself to you. Hold nothing back. I surrender myself to you fully. Some of you need to cross that line. You've, you've given yourself to God, but you're still holding on. Why don't you just cross the line and just abandon yourself and say, God, you own everything. I give my life to you. I'm not making a claim on anything. I give myself to you. I surrender fully to you. You want to come? Anybody want to come and just kneel down here and pray this morning? There's somebody here. You need to get something right with God. I challenge you to come today. We'll pray for you. If you need to repent of something, don't wait till later. Do it right now. God loves you. The blood of Jesus was shed for you. He'll forgive you. If you need forgiveness, man, receive it now. Get it right now. If there's somebody here you've never, never, committed your life to Jesus Christ, never fully surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, why don't you do it today? Why don't you do it today? I'm telling you, we're in the last days. Jesus is coming back. You need to be ready to meet him. Don't pass into eternity without being ready to meet God. Why don't you make the decision you've been putting off? Don't play games with God. Don't gamble with your eternal destiny. Oh, I'm telling you, this is I preach to you today this is the truth it's from the word of god you need to listen to it you need to obey the word of god give yourself to jesus don't hold anything back i want you to just begin to pray those of you who come go ahead op open your mouth lift up your voice begin to pray god touch me oh god i pray for a greater anointing i pray for a greater anointing why don't you ask him to touch you oh god fill me to overflowing Fill me again, fill me again, fill me again, fill me to overflowing. Breathe on me. Somebody got to pray, breathe on me, breathe on me, breathe on me. Oh God, fan the flames, fan the flames. I want to burn with love. I want to burn with passion and zeal. I want you to come and consume me with your love. Let me burn brightly. Let the light of Jesus shine through me. Oh, God, touch me today. Touch me today. Come on, make a decision. I preach a message like this. I don't, I don't just look for uh, opportunities that get you all stirred up or worked up emotionally. I want you to do business with God. I want you to make a commitment that will take you to a deeper level. I'm challenging you to make a commitment today and, and to give yourself fully to the Lord. Say, Jesus, right now, this moment, I'm giving myself to you and the desire of my heart is to give you everything I am and everything I hope to be, not holding back anything from you. Why don't you surrender yourself fully to him? Surrender yourself fully to him. Make up your mind. You're going to fight the good fight of faith every day, every day. Oh, God, touch your people today. God, hear our cry. Hear our cry, Lord. Oh, God, touch these that are here. I'm not going to start laying hands on you. I'd, I'd end up, I'd get going. We'd be here all afternoon. Now I want you just to reach out to God. Let him stretch out his hand. Let him stretch out his hand and touch you today. Oh, God. Oh, God. Come on, some of you, have, have you lost your first love? Has anybody, have you lost your first love? You're willing to humble yourself and admit it? Oh, God's not giving up on you. Don't you give up on yourself. Stir yourself up to take hold of God. Shake yourself. Wake up. Draw near to Jesus. Come on. We've got a job to do. Lost souls are hanging in the balance. Come on. Make the decision you know you need to make. 
I mean, make up your mind. I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. I'm going to be faithful to this gospel. I'm going to be faithful to this church. I'm going to let the light of Jesus shine through me. Oh, why don't you just pray and say, oh, God, use me. Use me. I'm not here just asking you to do good things for me. I'm here to say, God, I give myself to you. I want you to use me. I want you to work through me. Come on, pray. Oh, God, touch me, touch me. I'm telling you, your life can make a difference. Surrender yourself fully to God. Let him use you. Oh, God, touch your people. Just say, here I am, Lord. Be like Isaiah. Dare to say it. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, here I am, Lord. Send me. Just present yourself to God. That's what he wants. He wants your heart. More than anything, he wants your heart. Oh, God, touch your people today. Touch your people today. Oh, God. Oh, God. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. God, I pray for everyone here. I should have touched everyone. God, I pray for Priscilla. You shared your heart with her, Jesus. She has a heart for the nations. Now I know how the enemy will come to fight, try to discourage and hinder and hold back. How he'll try to get her to take her eyes off the goal that's set before her. I should encourage her and strengthen her, open doors for her, give her favor, provide for her. Oh, God, God, let your will be done. Lord, here's a young woman. She's not fighting against your will. She wants your will. I pray, God, let your will be done in her life. Let the kingdom of God come to Priscilla in all its fullness and all its power and all its glory. Let the provision of the kingdom come. Let the authority of the kingdom, the love, the peace, the righteousness, the joy, let the kingdom of God come to Priscilla. Hear the cry of her heart. Hear the deepest cry of her heart. Jesus, you know how to satisfy the longing soul. You know how to fill the hungry heart with goodness. I speak a blessing over this woman of God. Priscilla, I bless you in the name of Jesus. You rise up in faith to do all that God has called you to do. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless her. Why don't you do what this song says? I give myself away. I give myself to you, Jesus. I give myself to you. Strengthen him. 
bless him and use him, I pray in Jesus' name. All my dreams. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All my oh, God. Plans. Oh, God. Lord, Let your power. Let your power fall. Hallelujah. I give myself away. I give myself away. Listen, I want you just to do business with God. Just take a little longer. These are moments when everything can change just because of a decision that you make. Give myself. 
pray for every person in the, this building, for this church. God, for his glory, Christian Assembly has been a blessing to me, and now I want to speak a blessing over them, over Pastor Bob, Sister Linda, all those you've gathered here. God, I pray, especially for those who came to this altar, knelt down, and maybe entered into a deeper place than they had before. God, we're here to serve you. We're here in this world because you've got us here on a mission. I pray you'll stir us, Lord, and that we'll never forget why we're here. God, I pray for everyone who's fully surrendered themselves to you in the times of tribulation, the times of difficulty, the times of pressure, when it seems like everything's against us and things aren't working out the way they should i pray you'll help us to remember you said in this world you have tribulation but that we can be of good cheer of good courage because you would overcome the world god i pray your strength for every person who surrendered themselves fully to you today we're not here to play around this world's not a playground to us it's a battleground we're here to preach we're here to pray. We're here to fight. And we offer ourselves to you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Use us for your glory. Let the gospel be preached in all the nations. Let this church be a lighthouse to the nations in Jesus' name. God bless every person here today. I speak a blessing over their lives in Jesus' name. Thank you for your touch on our lives. We praise you. We love you. We give ourselves away to you, Jesus. Be glorified in Jesus' name. God bless you. I really I love you. I've been treated like royalty, and I've been blessed being with you. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Pastor, we love you. Thank you for coming. Amen. We pray, God, that your grace will continue to keep us, your Holy Spirit will lead us, and that, Father, we just want to thank you this morning for all that's taking place. Now, Lord, we ask that you bless their going in, their coming out, their lying down, their rising up. Bless them, Father God so that they can be a blessing to others. And Father, will not fail to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise of everything that's taken place this day. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Greet one another before you leave.